So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us all. There's lots of you viewing, which is great. So if I just go to my next slide. So yeah, welcome to day one of the Jasmine virtual event. I'm Poppy Townsend and I'm communications manager for um, the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, which is one of the teams that run Jasmine. So to get us started, who's speaking today? So all of these lovely faces are all of the team that have put together all of the talks today. I won't go through everyone's name and everyone's job role because you can all read. So there we all are. Um, we run Jasmine um, and most of us in this team are part of the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis team. But I just want to flag that we are um, part of a joint team across scientific computing department in STFC as well. So there's lots of other people behind the scenes, not just us on this screen. So a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. I'm sure many of you are aware of Zoom and probably sick to death of it. So we'll try and do this as smoothly as we can. But if you've got any questions, then please submit them on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll collate all of your submitted questions. And at the end of the day tomorrow, we're going to have a panel session where we're going to try and answer as many of them as we can. Um, we're not going to be able to do it today because of, we've got lots of stuff to cover. And yeah, we'll just run out of time if we try and do questions today. So submit them today and we'll answer them tomorrow. Um, if you've got any technical issues with Zoom, then please use the chat window and one of us will try and help you there. Or if you've got any other general kind of comments or anything, feel free to use the chat. But for any questions in particular, please use the Q&A. Um, and then final last bit of housekeeping is that we will be recording these webinars and sharing them um, online in a couple of weeks. Okay. So let's get to know you guys all a little bit, little bit better. I can see that we've got over 80 people joining us, but we can't see any of you. So we wanted to um, see who you all are and what, yeah, what type of Jasmine user. So let me just click on my poll button. So hopefully you should very shortly see a poll appear on your screen, which is asking you what type of Jasmine user you are. Oh, I can see people voting, fantastic. I'll keep, I'll keep leaving, oh, it's climbing up. Oh, nearly got all of you. Be quick, because I'll be clicking the end poll in just a second. Ready. Last few little stragglers. Okay, I'm going to end it. And poll. I think if I click share results, you should all be able to see the poll results, hopefully. Um, but if you can't, it's basically a lot of beginners and a lot of intermediates. So 50 50, and then a few advanced people in there as well. So hopefully, all of the content that we've prepared will be suitable for all of you. But bear this in mind that we're trying to cover a range of users. So I'm um, just going to go to the second poll we've got and see how often you all use Jasmine. Launch that one. Yes, you're voting. Fantastic. It's always great when technology works, isn't it? <laughs> oh, oh, you're a lot quicker this time. Well done, everyone. <laughs> Oh gosh, we've got lots of people using Jasmine daily, which is fantastic. We like to see that. Okay, I'm gonna close it in a second. Okay, and poll and share it with you. So, as you can all see, lots and lots of daily use of Jasmine, which is great and weekly. So, we like that we're doing um, a useful thing for all of you. So yeah, again, hopefully all of the content we've prepared is useful for you. Right, now what you're actually all um, interested in is the timetable for today, aren't you? So I'm sure you've already all seen this on the website, but I'll just quickly run through it. And just bear in mind that we're going to try and stick to the timings as closely as possible. But as it's live, things may go wrong. So bear with us if we um, are not quite sticking to time. So that's for this morning. We're going to have a 10 minute break as well. So you can all get yourselves a cup of coffee, have a little break, 
and then after 11 o'clock we will be doing five common issues and then it will be the end of day one so that's the timetable and I'm going to stop one minute over time and hand over to my colleagues Matt Pritchard, Ag Stevens and Phil Kershaw to give you all an update. Right. I stop sharing my screen. Are you ready to go, Matt? Yeah, thanks, Poppy. Hopefully this will work. Okay, is that showing my slide again? Yeah, sorry, I've muted myself. There you go. Okay, um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Matt Pritchard, I'm the um, Jasmine Operations Manager. Um, so myself, Ag and Phil will be giving you um, a bit of an update on um, Jasmine as it's been in the last uh, year or so. So um, without further ado, let's uh, move on. So perhaps just a, a quick refresher for those who are less familiar with Jasmine. <coughs> um, uh, Jasmine, let's have a recap of what it's, what it's all about. Um, so it's all about supporting large scale data intensive science, uh, primarily for the NERC and its wider related environmental science community. Um, enabling data analysis at the scales and the performance required by that community and um, providing the resources to do that. So access to the CEDAR archive, bringing data in from elsewhere and sharing that in um, project and community workspaces and providing some flexibility with them um, compute uh, capabilities to match uh, what people in those communities need to be able to do. Um, so how do we do that? Um, we provide um, a large scale high performance um, storage and compute, um, more focused on um, storage and compute for, for data analysis rather than pure number, number crunching, I can't remember the words, um, compared to a, a supercomputer. And we try and be um, a bit more flexible as a platform than a supercomputer um, and supporting a wider range of workflows and um, at quite a wide range of scales too. Um, so Jasmine is designed, built and operated um, by STFC on behalf of NERC um, with the responsibility for running different parts of Jasmine split between those of us at CEDA, Centre Environment for Environmental Data Analysis um, within RAL Space and our colleagues in scientific computing and uh, all of us based at RAL, at least um, in theory at the moment. So um, it's always been a bit of a challenge to try and represent Jasmine as a picture and um, we've, we've tried to um, put together these two diagrams, this one and the following one, um, to try and help explain and, and help you navigate around the system a bit better. So we've colour coded the various um, groups of services as you can see here so we've got um, information access analysis compute storage community cloud and um, some network components and um, we'll try and use these colors throughout our talks and we'll try and introduce them in the training materials to help you um, kind of orientate yourselves um, around the system So here are the, the same components arranged into um, the services, which hopefully um, you'll recognise, although there are some new things too. And uh, this is our kind of context diagram. And the idea is that all the technical talks um, uh, that we will have during the, um, the event will use this diagram as a kind of you are here indicator. Um, so perhaps for those of you yeah, less familiar with, with Jasmine, I'll talk you through a few examples. Um, so, for example, um, one particular user story uh, would be that um, using, say, the accounts portal, um, a new user can make themselves an account. And this is like a profile that various privileges can be attached to. Um, you then apply for Jasmine login access to give um, uh, yourself a system account. And that means you can then reach um, various systems on Jasmine via one of the login nodes. Um, you can then get to the interactive compute or scientific analysis, or we call them sci nodes, um, where there's a stack of software which is shared um, between the interactive compute and the batch compute. Um, and you can also build up a working environment within your home directory, which is stored on some uh, solid state disk storage here. And um, you might also belong to a group workspace, GWS, 
Um, this is something you can apply for through the accounts portal and then once you've got access to the shared storage you can share that with your collaborators, your project group. So perhaps once you've developed your own code, tested your own code, you can run it on the on the batch compute and um, perhaps making use of the, the shared scratch storage um, along the way. Um, perhaps because you needed some feature of that particular storage, we'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, and then uh, if you clean up after yourself, after you've used that shared storage, of course, um, then you can uh, perhaps move the output back to the group workspace to share with your colleagues and collaborators. So that's, that's one example of, of, of a particular user story. If we have a look at another one, um, just briefly, uh, this time we've got um, a user uh, pushing data to Jasmine from an external data source, for example, a model run on a um, supercomputer like Archer via one of the data transfer nodes. Um, if it's a big um, uh, voluminous data transfer, you might want to use uh, the high performance data transfer nodes here in this special zone of the network. Um, you can push it to what's called the transfer cache, which you can self provision yourself some, some large storage where you can decide uh, what data you want to keep. You might put some of it into the group workspace, um, uh, some of it onto tape, um, and then uh, uh, use the um, storage migration service, the JDMA, to move the data between those different storage media. And then you can uh, do whatever um, compute task uh, you need to analyzing those data that you've brought in. So that's another user story. The third one, um, again, using different bits of the system. So this group, you know, they like what they've seen in the managed environment of Jasmine. Um, but what they really want to do is build their own um, specialist platform within the um, uh, community cloud. So they've got some resources in an external tenancy here um, using building blocks that we can provide and they can use the cloud portal to administer their portion of this, of this cloud computing um, platform. So it's their tenancy, they can deploy virtual machines and assemble other components for, for what they need from building blocks that are provided. So that gives you a kind of brief overview of, of um, some of the sort of services and, and uh, what Jasmine looks like. Let's have a look at what happened in, in 2020. Um, well, it's fair to say what, what hasn't happened in 2020. It's been a bit of an odd year, really. Um, we, you, the whole world has had a pretty sort of unprecedented change to what we call normal. And we're still adapting to that as the situation evolves. Um, fairly early on, um, back in March, the Cedar and Jasmine teams moved to uh, working remotely, which although we're used to collaborating um, over you know, various um, technologies, um, it did sort of have an effect on, uh, on the way we could work. And it was a still a big change to adapt to. Um, so uh, there's significant, um, so yeah, uh, the, the Cedar and Jasmine teams have been working remotely since then. And um, uh, quite a lot of the um, uh, uh, the scientific computing team's work involves working in um, the machine room um, and uh, some of their tasks involve um, installing new pieces of kit, that kind of thing. Um, and that's been fairly heavily affected by um, the COVID restrictions. So this is our infrastructure manager, Jonathan, fully kitted out in all his PPE, um, ready to do some work in the machine room. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's listed for us some things here that's how, how it's affected his work. So for any task where his team has to, to work in pairs, so if there's some heavy servers that need to be installed, they can't help but work less than two metres apart. Um, so the visit needs to be planned in advance. Uh, there's very limited time slots, full written risk assessment needed. Um, it's quite hot in there in all this kit. And then there's an A4 checklist of all the um, things he needs to do safely before entering and leaving even if he needs to nip out to the bathroom halfway through. Um, so it's really affected um, the progress of, of some of the work that, that goes on in the background that perhaps, perhaps the users, uh, new users are, are perhaps um, uh, unaware of. So um, really, I think in any other year, um, you know, saying that we kept the lights on would be uh, less of a significant achievement. But I think really this year, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, uh, we're, we're very proud of the fact that we've managed to, to keep the operation running. Um, at, at an early stage, it was far from obvious that that was going to be the case. And so we, we owe a, a big debt of gratitude to our colleagues in SCD for, for their, their hard work in keeping the lights on. 
Um, we've made some changes, as we always do, um, and uh, we need to do that to keep up to date with various um, uh, to, to cope as Jasmine grows, but also to keep the system secure and up to date. And um, we're going to tell you about some of these in uh, the lightning talks later on this morning, which will then point to uh, some more detailed talks on each topic tomorrow. Um, as well as some of the more visible changes, we've reorganised the way we manage the, the help desk, um, splitting Jasmine from the Cedar Archive help desk, which lets us categorise and um, uh, triage queries in a more efficient way and helps us uh, organise our help documentation at help.jasmine.ac.uk, keep that up to date with the system as a whole. We've also launched some new capabilities this year, um, some of them just in time for lockdown to keep frustrated scientists busy. And again, you can hear more about these later in the talks um, that will follow. Um, we've also continued to plan for the future. So we're now in phase seven of our kind of um, ongoing procurement programme with um, some purchases planned for this year to refresh and replace older hardware and ready Jasmine for the next few years. And Phil will be talking about that in, um, in his section just following uh, after Ag. So it's been a very challenging and, and busy year for the Jasmine team, and we're very keen to share everything that we've been up to with you. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Ag Stevens, who's going to talk about what's been happening with uh, software and workflows on Jasmine. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, just confirm that everyone can hear me. Can I have a thumbs up? Fantastic. Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to talk briefly about workflows and software on Jasmine. Um, and in particular, we're, we're really thinking here following the kind of user story pattern that Matt was talking about. So um, thinking about how you might want to find a new software on Jasmine and then how you want to develop your data processing workflows. Um, by the way, I'm Ag Stevens and I'm the head of partnerships at CEDA. So coming back to Matt's diagram, this particular um, part of the talk focuses on two areas. So here in the middle, we, we have the compute services section. And so within that, we have the software that's provided on Jasmine. Um, and then we have the batch compute component. So this is, this is essentially Lotus, our batch compute system. And then down the bottom within the storage box, um, we're pointing to various components here. So you might be reading data from the Cedar archive. Um, you might be writing to either the scratch space or group workspaces. Um, and you might even have some software installed in your home directory as well and be using that. So just to take a step back, um, Jasmine is a big data platform. And that means that people are trying to do um, significant amounts of work on it. And if we just have a, a very quick course review of the last 30 years, um, in 1990, as a scientist, you might be um, using some very modern and up-to-date tools such as uh, Microsoft Excel. And, and within a spreadsheet or two, that might be enough to store all the data that you need to worry about and allow you to do some kind of analysis and um, generate some kind of graphs. Moving on 10 years, it's more likely that you'd be moving into using programming languages to um, define your, your workflows, your algorithms and your processing. Um, and then 10 years ago, it was very common for people to be doing some quite sophisticated data analysis. Um, so it may not have necessarily been on a laptop, but, but typically um, most scientists were probably still using a single machine. And, and typically you write some code and then you run it and you watch it running in front of you. You might leave it overnight, you might leave it running over the weekend, but, but generally it was about setting up a single process and watching it go. So now here we are in 2020 and pretty much most people working within the sort of earth sciences domain um, are dealing with the problem or the joy of big data. And so here we have a nice diagram of Jasmine. Typically, you're looking at building workflows where you have to break up the overall task into loads of little smaller jobs and then have some way of, of orchestrating those across a platform and keeping track of them all and making sure everything worked. So in terms of the user requirements for that kind of big data processing, 
um, it's worth us just spending a moment to think about you know what what the average project that comes to jasmine might need so you want access to any software packages that you might need you want access to a stable and unchanging software environment and you need that for the duration of the project but possibly also when you come back later on and need to rerun something so the idea there is that, that you want you want the environment not to change under your feet halfway through the project You'd like access to unlimited processing capability and you need that at the exact time when you're ready to run because as we know with lots of projects um, actually getting the code into a state when it's ready to run can often take half the project or most of the project um, so you need access at a certain point that's relevant to you you need access to unlimited storage potentially just in case you need it Again, at the start of a project, it is very hard to exactly um, calculate how much storage you'll need. You might need three times the amount of your final data because you've got temporary files and your processing requires um, duplication along the way. And then it would be really nice to have access for access to tools that allow you to manage those workflows across a platform such as Jasmine. So if we think about how we as the the facility managers respond to those requirements um, we need to be able to provide access to software packages so we do that by providing um, a centrally installed set of packages that are both available on our interactive sci servers and on the lotus cluster um, we now have a system in place which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute and uh, in more detail tomorrow um, which we call Jaspi, and that's about supporting multiple software environments on a single platform. So not only could we have a Python 2.7 and a Python 3.7 environment, we could also have different versions of Python 3.7 environments um, with different groups of packages at different versions within them. When it comes down to processing capability, we provide a set of interactive servers um, but the idea is that you use those to develop your workflows, to, to debug and, and build your workflows. And actually, whenever you want to do any real work, you then send those off to the Lotus Batch comp Compute Cluster. In terms of storage, we provision both um, project-specific storage um, in the form of group workspaces, or, or GWS, as we call them, and also there's a a significant chunk of scratch disk and a scratch there scratch is there as um, a common piece of disk that you can use for your temporary outputs when you're running your workflows so you may choose to write some data to scratch um, and then at the end of your workflow copy it back to the group workspace um, where you're going to keep your final outputs and in terms of tools to manage workflows um, we provide some some of these tools, which I'll mention in a minute. And we also are doing our best to provide um, some best practice guidance on how you go about building workflows. And I'll be giving a, um, a, a talk later on in the um, five common issues session about workflow management. So a really important take home message from this is that, that your workflows should be running on Lotus. Even if you're doing something that is only taking half an hour or an hour to run, it's really, really sensible if you develop it on the interactive nodes over here. But actually, when you're going to run anything for real, run it on the batch compute system, which we call Lotus. And in terms of storage, you're mainly going to be interested in your group workspaces that you might be interacting with. You might be writing to scratch temporarily. Um, you might also be reading data from the CEDAR archives. You might be processing data that we've catalogued and curated in the CEDAR archive. So in terms of building robust workflows, there are a number of really important things that, that it's worth thinking about. So one of them is which software packages do I need? So in that case, you want to think about whether they are already provided in an environment on Jasmine. Um, is the software installed in an optimal location? Um, I ask this question because there are many different types of disks. 
as Matt pointed out. Um, so if we go back here, we've got all these different types of storage um, and they perform differently um, with different types of files. So some of them are optimized for small files. Um, so for example, your home directory and small files group workspaces are particularly optimized to manage lots of small files. If your workflow has a lot of small files or if your software is installed somewhere, then it's gonna work a lot better on those systems. Can you optimize your tasks to the Jasmine file systems? Um, so that's really the same thing. When, when might you want to use a small files optimized system? When do you want to use a standard group workspace? When do you want to use scratch disk? Um, and you can stage your outputs on scratch disk if appropriate. Um, other important things to consider just in terms of managing your disk space, but also as, as a good Jasmine citizen, are you deleting, deleting your temporary files? Are you cleaning up after your processes? If you're processing tens of terabytes, then it's really important that you have something which follows up afterwards and just gets rid of um, anything you no longer need. There are some projects that are working at such a scale that they need to actually stage data onto tape. So we um, have a tape archive available to um, Jasmine users. And in some cases you may need to actually stage some data onto tape and just pull it back when people need to process it. Um, and a really important thing about robust workflows is, do you have the means to verify that your tasks have completed? And I'll come back to this later on when I'm talking in more detail about workflows. So thinking a bit, a bit more about software on Jasmine, um, there is a talk tomorrow um, in which will go into more detail about the software that we provide and different types of software. Um, one of the key things is we recognize that it's an overhead to manage all your own software. And so where possible, we try and provide Jasmine with a kind of batteries included approach. So on the analysis servers, on the batch servers, you will find a whole range of packages installed in pre-configured pre environments. Um, the, the main environments are called Jaspi down here on the left. Um, and you can see some examples of the kind of packages that we install by default into those environments. Of course, people will also need to do their own thing. So we provide compilers, um, we provide um, advice and tools that will help you build software and, and build your own environment as you need to. We have some software that is restricted in different ways or, or commercial. So we run IDL and um, users can ha have access to IDL. Um, and we have some software that is only available on certain servers and you may have to register for access to it. An example of that is the Moose client, um, which gives access to the, the mass data store at the Met Office. Um, and of course, there's also a lot of data transfer or data movement software. And we have some really good help pages that, that talk you through the options on that and try and help advise you on the best way to go about data transfer. You got two minutes, Ag. Thank you. Um, so software for workflows, um, you should consider whether you're um, using the pre-installed environment, you can extend those environments. Um, we have advice on building your own environments. And it's really important that you know which environment that you're actually using. So if you want to have a reproducible workflow, you should know that if you're loading, for example, the, the Jaspi environment, um, which one is it actually specifically using? So these are tagged with revision numbers that are the date stamped, and it's important for you to know exactly what that is. We have some workflow management tools. Um, so we have some tools developed by the Met Office and NIWA in New Zealand called Rose and Silk. And if you want to build kind of multi-step workflows. Um, these are really useful. They have a graphical interface and they talk directly to Lotus. So they will run all the jobs on the Lotus cluster. And as part of our Jasmine workshops, um, we have an exercise on that that talks you through how to build a very simple rose and silk workflow. Um, I'm gonna talk later on about this thing called ABC unit. So this is an example framework we have built that's about breaking up a big workflow into manageable reusable chunks. 
and I'll give a lot of advice later on about how you can go and how you can construct something like that. You can make it robust and rerunnable. Um, and this is just a good example of how you would do that. And finally, I just want to mention that we've also in the last year launched our Jasmine notebook service. Um, so most people will have heard about Jupyter Notebooks. Um, they are interactive pro programming environments that run in the web browser. And in this case, it's a Python 3 environment. Um, so we've, we've launched the notebook service so that you can do various things on our systems. You can define, edit, and run code in Python. You can access a JASP 3.7, Python 3.7 common software environment. And most important of all, you get access to the CEDAR archive and your group workspace. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about working with the um, Jasmine notebook service, um, then tune into our um, um, talk about it tomorrow. So I will now hand you over to Phil, who is going to talk through technical developments. Thank you. Phil, you're muted at the moment. Brilliant. Right, that's better, isn't it? Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Okay, thanks. Uh, is that showing the presentation? No. No, it's the wrong thing. Sorry. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> There we go. Great. Okay. So I'm technical manager at Cedar, and I'm going to talk about some of the um, sort of wider technical developments and um, so the direction we're headed in really um, with some of the new services that we're building, some of the new services that have come online in the last year. But before I do, I just want to um, have a, a sort of a little bit of diversion. Um, we're We've got a, a procurement underway at the moment with Jasmine, so for uh, the next phase, and just wanted to point out some headlines about that. We're going to be expanding our storage, um, but also I've put a ring around it here. Um, we're going to be um, expanding our GPU capability for AI workloads as well. So for the main content of my talk, I want to focus on these three areas. Um, recap. Um, the kind of Jasmine model, uh, the kind of concept for Jasmine, and then look at that um, in the context of what I've called environments and customization. So Ag was talking about software environments. So I want to talk about a wider sort of environment of the um, surrounding infrastructure that makes up Jasmine and how you're able to customize that for different purposes. And then following on from that, there's a, a sort of consequence to that, which is uh, there are um, things about the way that we do our data access um, that are gonna need to evolve and change as Jasmine grows, particularly around using something called object storage. Okay, so at its heart, um, it's about uh, the ability to um, bring your compute and your data together into one place. And as Ag was saying, there's this big data challenge, but I think another uh, really nice dimension that we've seen with Jasmine um, since it started is this element of sharing and, and bringing different groups of people together. So uh, those of you who use Jasmine, you'd be aware that you can um, uh, have a group workspace provisions and um, you can share that space with um, your uh, colleagues or your uh, fellow uh, researchers but also that data can be uh, incorporated into the CD data archive as well. So it's kind of like a big sharing environment, which I think is, is really a uh, powerful concept as well. So I think this diagram really shows <laughs> how it's, it's a big challenge, right? Because um, the conceptually it's quite simple what we're trying to achieve, but actually in reality, because of um, the technologies we're dealing with, um, budgets, um, what people are able to learn to use, all the different tools, it gets actually quite complicated and you have to sort of find your way um, through all these different services um, to the best way to do what you need to do. So whether it's a workflow that Ag was talking about or some of the other user stories that uh, Matt was going through. So at its heart, um, you, you probably start with some uh, code 
um, and it's you know it's running perhaps on your computer or maybe on a um, computing system at your uh, home institution and then that runs in an operating system and to a greater or lesser extent you can um, customize that so Ag was talking about having conjure environments uh, for example which is really powerful but I, what I want to talk about is the big sort of greener area around the outside so if it's running on Jasmine to what extent can you customize things to achieve what you need to do and we spend quite a lot of our time um, when we have operations meetings internally talking about some of these things because we have users who come to us and they're using different services um, but they need to do something just a little bit different and uh, to customize it and so um, what we try to do with Jasmine is make it a flexible environment where we can build different pieces together to allow users to do these specialized cases so that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So if we think about that uh, the ability to customize um, some people's first experience of using Jasmine is with these um, analysis uh, virtual machines. So it's an interactive one um, where you log in and it's a, a, a Linux machine and it's shared across all the Jasmine users and it's got um, different software packages installed in it. So that's great. It's a good start. Um, we've got this ability now to do virtual desktops, which really makes it much nicer and flexible, which is good. Um, but also we've got this new capability as well, which we're going to be um, growing over the next few months of allowing users to uh, make their own um, analysis virtual machine. So we're doing that using our community cloud. So the idea is that uh, a group can have an allocation um, of like um, uh, memory and computing power in order to be able to mint or create these virtual machines from the cloud and, and share those um, in that group. So that makes things a lot more flexible and scalable. So the next thing is the Jupyter Notebook service, which Ag mentioned. And a really nice thing about that is that um, when people log in, they get a notebook um, through their browser. And actually under, under the, uh, behind the scenes rather, uh, what's happening is that there's actually a, a kind of a virtual computer being made for them, a Docker container. So it's like rather like you have your own computer that's made for you just for that session. So that's a really nice, uh, nice capability. So moving on from that, we've got this um, new thing, which we call cluster as a service. So we've been using that for um, a couple of years now. We've got quite a few groups using it. It builds on top of our cloud environment. And the idea of it is that um, you can um, make um, a custom environment, a custom piece of infrastructure out of some building blocks. So when you start your project, you go to the cloud portal and you go through a series of steps and um, you can pick from a menu of different options. And so you can see these options here on this screenshot. And the one in the, the bottom there, Pangeo, is a good example. It's a, a popular open source um, kind of collaboration and it includes things like um, Jupyter Hub. So it allows you to run your own Jupyter uh, notebook service. And uh, we were talking about some of these capabilities um, yesterday amongst ourselves. And it's, it's rather like with this, that you can kind of make your own mini Jasmine uh, from the cloud system. So you can have your own batch computing environment, you can have your own notebook service. So I'm stealing a little bit of the thunder, I think of some of the talks that are coming uh, next. Um, but uh, what I want to do is try and uh, show how they all fit together and, um, and, and help us to build this kind of wider capability of being able to customize Jasmine. So what about data access? We've got a data access problem, unfortunately, and um, it's really to do with our cloud computing um, environment, but there are other issues as well, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, but what we're trying to do to address it is use um, a new kind of storage, object store, um, increasingly throughout, uh, throughout Jasmine. And we've got some um, early uses of it, uh, which I'll say a little bit about. So if somebody's using our cloud environment, they're, they're using the kind of the green box over in the right hand side with a purple background there. And if they want to access the, uh, the data, the storage, if they're using like a regular interface with like a file path and using the commands you're familiar with, like CD and LS and all those kind of things, you can't actually access it from our cloud system. So the access model that we have is you can be thought of as being a bit limiting in a way you're fixed to um, being able to access it if you've got a Jasmine ID. And pretty much 
unless you can SSH in, you can't really see that data. Um, with object store, it's very different. Um, the access model is through HTTP. So as you would do through a browser or through web services, if you're familiar with that from programming. So it means that basically you can expose the data potentially um, anywhere in the world, but importantly for us, in our case, you can access it from our Jasmine cloud system. So there are big changes and Neil's talk is gonna talk, I think more about this kind of thing. What, what does it mean to use object store? How do you uh, integrate your applications with it? Um, but fortunately, um, there's quite a lot of work going on in this space and um, for example, in the Earth observation community, there's something called cloud optimized geotiffs, which is a special kind of um, format of uh, data that works really well with object store. And in the climate community, there are tools like X-Array and Czar um, for putting NetCDF data onto object store and also our own project S3 NetCDF Python. So there's some work we can take advantage of there. We've got quite a few early adopters using object store on uh, Jasmine. And there's one of them that I just want to pick out um, at the end, uh, DEFRA JNCC, and they're working with um, satellite data. And if we look at our um, overview diagram again, it's using the object store at the bottom. It's labeled as the HPOS and the sort of cloudy shaped icon and using our cloud environment as well. So how does it all fit together? We've got this workflow moving from uh, left to right. So they've got some satellite products coming in, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 and they're processing them using the uh, Lotus batch compute environment. So nothing unusual there. They're outputting it to regular storage um, in a group workspace. But then what they're gonna be doing, and this is work that's um, underway at the moment, is they're gonna write it out into object store um, using X-Array and Czar and write it into this format so that it can be used with a special open data cube software, which allows you to um, access the data, all these different satellite projects um, products as if they're like a huge cube, a multi-dimensional cube in the spatial and time dimension. But what's really nice from Jasmine's point of view is that we can provide our cluster as a service system. So here they, they get pretty much out of the box their own um, notebook service, which they can deploy um, into the cloud, but they can customize that to integrate it together with the open data cube so that people can go into the notebook and then access the data cube from that notebook two minutes um, Phil. okay thanks so where next with the object store um, we're going to be looking at improving access and performance and improving management tools as well so you can um, better manage access to it and access rules for users as uh, so to restrict or make the data open there's also some pilots we're doing as well to look at uh, best um, storage formats um, because this is quite a challenge at the moment, particularly around, I would say, net CDF data, what's the best approach for us to take and what, what's the community out there doing? So yeah, I've recapped on the, the Jasmine core concepts and um, said how this is gonna be delivered in terms of the services and how you can customize things in Jasmine. So this customization element is an area in which we've got quite a few new services which we've developed recently over you know, the last couple of years. And uh, just to say that it's got consequences for us um, moving forward where we're seeking to use object store more extensively. And I think this is going to ripple outwards. It's not just for specialized applications with cloud. It's something that we're gonna be looking to use more extensively across all of Jasmine for all kinds of use cases. That's me done, thank you. Great, thanks Phil. Um, so I think up next we've got the lightning talks. Um, so I just need to share my screen. Um, where is it? Is there any problem with this other than that, that you've got hundreds of tabs open? Right, hopefully you should all be able to see my screen now. Thumbs up if you can. Fab, thank you. Right, so these are gonna be really quick two minute talks from all of our speakers who are doing um, a talk about all of the new developments. So these talks will be done tomorrow, but this is just kind of to sell the talks to you today so you can decide which ones you want to come to. Hopefully all of them, but we know you're all busy people. So first up, we've got Ag. So Ag, are you ready? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna click the two minute timer because I'm gonna be strict, okay? Okay. That's your timer, ready, get. The um, slide jumped, Poppy. Oh, no. Hang on. Okay. 
chaos. There you go. Um, so I'm going to give a uh, talk tomorrow about software, our software stack. Um, so different parts of the um, Jasmine software system, primarily focusing on the common software packages that are available and Jaspi, as I mentioned earlier on, um, explaining how that provides support for multiple environments and how you can go and find which packages are available within each environment. Um, I'll mention community, commercial software and transfer software as well. Um, and I think this is important to anyone working on Jasmine because it'll save you a lot of time if you know where you get help for these things, what software is available, um, what's, what different types of environment available, how you can activate those environments, um, how you can use them with each other, um, what are some of the dangers and issues if you, um, if you don't know how those things work. Um, and I, I'll also add a little bit of information about building your own environments as well. This also touches on what I was saying earlier on about different file systems on Jasmine. Um, so you want to know where your software stack is. Um, you want to know where you're going to build your own software. And if you're trying to share your sof software with other people, um, you want to be able to um, put it in the right place and give people access. That's enough from me. OK, fab. Thanks, Ag. Right, over to you, Fatima. Um, let me unmute you. Here we go. Fatima, there we go. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Fatima Chami, and I'm uh, assuring the Jasmine user support. I'm going to be uh, talking tomorrow about the transition to Slurm, um, which is the new uh, officially supported resource management for the Lotus cluster. And also it's um, Slurm is considered to be um, used by many other organization and uh, academia, for example, Archer, MetaOffice and Jasmine. And also I emphasize on the new implementation of the MPI library to support uh, distributed memory uh, parallel jobs. Uh, the key message of tomorrow's talk is um, uh, encouraging everyone to convert their workflow to Slurm and also encouraging everyone who is still using the interactive uh, machines for um, a workflow to convert them into batch compute. And also I'll be mentioning uh, some MPI impl 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 implications for applications that need to be uh, built and installed again to run on the new um, on the new system and a mention of the new AMD Lotus host that were added recently and thank you. Wow, fantastic we're all whizzing through these great thanks Fatima. Uh, just click next slide so Matt are you ready? Yeah I'm ready. Go. All right so um yeah, uh, people will be familiar with um, the uh, scientific analysis or sign machines that we've had in place for many years. Um, one of the issues with these is that they can get overloaded. Um, and so there is a different way that we can provide these. Um, and that's making use of our uh, Jasmine community cloud. Um, so we now plan to provide um, kind of exclusive um, sign machines to communities um, instead of, um, or at least alongside, um, the, the sort of general purpose shared by everyone um, sign machines. Um, we've piloted this in the past, but we now have some new capacity in a, in a new part of the Jasmine Community Cloud. Um, so uh, I'll be talking um, about uh, what we've done so far, how they work, and what our plans are um, to take this forward. Um, but yeah, um, it's well worth um, uh, listening to that because uh, the provision of the sign machines uh, will be changing. I think we'd like to make this the default model that we provide these sign machines to um, to communities uh, by default with the other ones as a, as a kind of fallback. And the big advantage really is that it gives um, each community um, some autonomy to manage their own commu uh, compute. So uh, with their own um, set of users, uh, they can apply access control to that set of users they can um, scale out, so deploy new uh, further machines as, as um, uh, requirements dictate. 
and also have some control over the usage patterns. Um, so perhaps conflicting groups with different usage patterns, that problem kind of goes away if you've just got one um, uh, smaller community using uh, a machine or set of machines. So uh, I'll be talking about all those issues. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. Right, up next, I think we've got Ag again, and this one's going to doubly confuse me because I've got two things to click. I got ready. There we go. Thank you, Poppy. Um, so I mentioned earlier on that we've launched this new notebook service, and the hardest thing is to understand what this thing is. So if you look at the animation, you can see that there, there is a browser open, and I'm typing Python code into the browser, and it appears to be executing. So in a nutshell, that's what a, a, a Jupyter notebook is. Um, so I'll be introducing um, from scratch, really, what notebooks are about and highlighting some of the features and advantages of um, notebooks in general, but also our specific Jasmine notebook service. Um, the, the important thing from your perspective, if you've seen a notebook sort of service before is, you've probably been waiting for us to launch this. So it's definitely time to get involved. If you've not seen one before, um, it's, it's a different interactive environment. Essentially, you, you kind of have the same access that you would if you were SSHing into, um, into a Jasmine Sci server. Um, but there are some nice things that you can see in a, in a notebook such as um, you can create visualizations and they will appear inside the the notebook itself. Um, you can access data in the Cedar archive and in group workspaces in this new kind of lab book environment and you can also share your workflows and collaborate with others really nicely. So around the world scientists are using Jupyter notebooks as a way to um, develop workflows to capture them and then share them with with other people in their communities. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Zach. Okay, next up we've got Matt Pryor. Can you hear me? We can. Good. Wait, let me click. Uh, okay, so my name is Matt Pryor. I'm a senior DevOps engineer, um, which means I build stuff. Um, so what the thing I wanted to talk about is the cluster as a service that Phil alluded to, which is about um, building your own custom platforms using the Jasmine cloud for your project. Um, we provide these pre-assembled building blocks that you can put together to build your own platform. Um, you can think of this like a, a mini Jasmine. So it gives you a sort of things like identity providers, clusters, uh, clusters that look a lot like Lotus, clusters that look a lot like the notebook service, uh, but they're all for your specific project or group. And we provide a simple interface for configuring these through the Jasmine cloud portal. Um, like Phil said, and the important thing really is that this is a dedicated resource for your project. So you can do what you want with it. It's still cloud, so it's still customizable, um, but we take a lot of the pain out of configuring some of these complex pieces of software. Um, I think that's probably all I wanted to say. Tune in tomorrow if you're interested in it. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, we've got Neil next. Okay, hi, I'm Neil Massey. I'm a senior software engineer at CEDA. And um, tomorrow at 10 past 11, I'll be talking about object storage and as Phil has already mentioned, object storage is the future of storage. It's, uh, we've got five petabytes so far um, on Jasmine, but that's really just a kind of um, proof of concept type um, system at the moment. And well, you can still use it um, as well as any other storage, but we'll be getting a lot more. Um, so that object storage is much more scalable and performant, and it's also uh, flexible as Phil mentioned, you can um, see your data at the end of URLs. And that makes it very suitable for cloud um, computing model. And, but the interaction with it is very diff diff different to a regular file system. So as users, why should you care? Well, regular file systems, they don't scale in terms of performance, affordability, 
and um, access control and so object stores solve many of those problems. Um, it simplifies the access to the data. As I said, you can expose it as a URL, makes it much better for cloud computing. Um, but you need a change in workflow to use these effectively. Um, but there are live applications and libraries to help with this, and I'll be talking about some of those tomorrow, um, such as S3 NetCDF and X-Ray and ZAR. And there'll also be some um, basic examples of just, just streaming a text file backwards and forwards to Object Store. So that's like a, a good way to get started and to learn what object stores are about. So, okay, I'll stop there and uh, see you at 10 past 11 tomorrow. Thanks, Neil. All right, and then finally, we've got another Matt. You may have noticed we've got lots of Matts. We've got Matt Jones this time. All right, so um, I'm Matt Jones. I'm a, a Jasmine DevOps engineer. Um, uh, over the last uh, year or so, uh, we've been developing um, a Jasmine metric service. Um, a metric is um, a measurable quantity which uh, can generally be used to build time series data. So for example, this could be um, the amount of free space in a group workspace or the number of users we have on Jasmine. Uh, talk a bit about how, how we're gathering them. And we're also going to be producing um, targeted dashboards for different groups of users. For example, we have um, a general Jasmine dashboard and a, a group workspace manager dashboard. Uh, so why should you care uh, about this? Um, the the uh, aim is that the metrics uh, and dashboards will provide up-to-date information about the Jasmine system and its resources to us and also to to users. Thanks. Fab. Thank you. Oh, I've gone backwards. Hang on. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. That was fantastic. And we all stuck to time, so it's great. Um, so next up, we've got Fatima talking about all of our training and events. So Fatima, are you ready? Let me just stop sharing. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, share the screen. Can you see the screen now? We can. Thanks, Martin. Um, try to change to the pointer. Okay. Okay. Um, so. Um, Thanks for joining. I'll be talking today about training and events. Uh, so the all, um, an overview of today's talks will be um, just um, uh, giving the reason why we want to engage users into this training and um, to ensure um, them that they use the facility efficiently, also to help them find where the information is about past training and where to find events for future training. Um, we'll cover a bit on the documentation side, uh, um, an introduction of a beacon feature for more interaction with the documentation and how they can help us to improve it. Um, and also on the help desk support. And uh, finally, I'll just um, show a list of future and training events for end of this year and next year. So what is a Jasmine user support? The Jasmine user support here covers different areas from help desk to docs um, to um, training. Sorry, the
just lift the pointer if you used to hack it. Um, and why we need why we need to do all this and mainly at the training because the training is mainly in helps um, engaging in a one to one basis. It helps also users to interact among themselves and interact with the Jasmine uh, service provider team. Um, and also encourage user to use the facility in a more efficient way through sharing their experience and through exercise and training and promote Jasmine capabilities. So we also in, in this training, we try to um, uh, give example of new services, how to use them. But before deciding on the training, we had to do uh, a bit of work on what is the user needs? What are those training needs? And we base our evaluation on the uh, on analyzing the very common issues from the help desk queries. We looked at uh, the, uh, the results that we collected from um, a survey that was run in 2017. We also looked at the feedback that users uh, uh, were participants of the past uh, few Jasmine user conferences events. And uh, finally, we looked at how the documentation has been used from some statistics on top article or category section, also some popular searches keywords. And we came up with a plan of running several training and that can of difference um, uh, on different uh, aspects could be webinars uh, to hands on and this slide summarize um, um, the past training and events. So we started in uh, 2016, 2017, we ran the first two uh, user conferences on Jasmine and the format of that event had, um, had a, a day or half a day training workshop. And from then, uh, which was really, really uh, uh, welcomed and um, encouraged us to think about having a proper workshop day uh, where we has more of a hands-on and practical uh, exercise. So we started um, the first um, uh, workshop in 2019, but before that we did uh, run a few uh, webinars um, on different aspects of the uh, services. And then, um, sorry, I think the first conference uh, works, workshop was uh, in 2019, actually it was a hands-on workshop. And we tried when we developed the material for this workshop, it's based on a, a series of exercise, which cover from um, beginner to, um, more, to advanced intermediate to more advanced uh, um, users. And uh, 2020, we, 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 as we speak now, we're having the first uh, Jasmine online event today. And we did, have, we did run some uh, a, a webinar um, in May and uh, do another workshop, hands-on one uh, at the Met Office this year. So where to find the material? So the, all the material, um, including the presentation, the poster, and the conference program are available on, on, on here for the conference 2018, 16 and uh, 17. And as I said, uh, those events had a half a day uh, training session and all the training plus the demo are, are available uh, online um, through this um, uh, radio button. So you can click and you can access the video recording as well as the presentation. And also I'll just point it here that um, the conference program is also if, um, uh, useful to have, uh, to have a look at what, how Jasmine has been used, how Jasmine has helped uh, different projects from different communities. And also it's a way to explore the, uh, the, uh, the um, capability of Jasmine and also you know, uh, share knowledge with others. And I'll just mention here, there has, we, had, we had some people who, had, the way they came to us was from, from the looking at the Jasmine program, which is quite fascinating that the Jasmine program, they looked at the presentation, they find yeah, this fits our needs, and we, 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 they contacted us, and they are now as, uh, as our, uh, um, uh, among our users. So, they, um, so this, is, this is just a screenshot of what's 
presented on the Jasmine uh, um, conference program page. So for the webinar and, uh, and the workshop, everything is available here as it shows on the slides. So the recording um, and the presentation are available and uh, on this website, which is uh, www.ac.uk events. And it's um, compromised all, all events, all past events with the, with the associated material as well as the future event so we encourage you to watch to for future events to watch this, this space and if they need access to material to go to the past event and select there's a selection of all e events that were run uh, in, in, um, in the past same applies for the workshop so for the hands-on on jasmine workshop the material is available um, on the um, on the tab and on this web, web page it's same what to do with event but under the tab workshop and the the material uh, the exercise the tutorial and the uh, source code if any is also available on the github and all this material links to this GitHub. So um, this, the first page of the GitHub gives an overview of the different exercise and a links to the, um, to the exercise material from, from uh, the resource tab. So I encourage users to have a look at this exercise, um, clone the repository and try to use them. And you can choose from very uh, big for beginners, I would buy exercise one and two uh, to more advanced, like building your own, your own Python environment or compiling uh, parallel codes. For the documentation, we it's uh, constantly in improvement, and we are constantly adding uh, documentation for new services and how to use them. And we're constantly restructuring the documentation as we look at the statistics report on how how uh, article has been used, uh, how article of how many times article has been viewed, and also to make an easy way for user to navigate from one topic to the other in, in, in the articles. We welcome report and feedback from users, and we have now a feature which is this beacon that allows uh, online or on the fly interaction with the documentation. So we encourage you if there is any, any incomplete information or any detail that needs to be added or any of your feedback to get in touch with us through this beacon. And then the other aspects of this user support is the help desk. Of course, the help desk is, main, is, the, is the main main uh, user support, but we, will, we welcome users to contact us through the beacon and because it helps them to self uh, categorize, categorize the, the, their query we make a different tags for that for this and also we want to in, de, in, de, in, descri in describing the issue we really want to have a concise description that will save us time and effort into engaging in a thread of conversation so any links uh, any error related to um, um, error messages from from running the, the scripts or the code any environment that we need we need to be aware of so for example uh, outputting the env command so we're not exactly at the desk of the user trying to see we are remotely away and that information is very essential for us and also to help us kind of replicate the issue to see, um, we, to see exactly what is the problem. So, and also any relevant logs or any user working directory. I have to mention here in terms of support, we're not giving, we're not supporting application, for example, WRF or any other application. So we encourage users to contact the developers of any particular application. So we support the application running, but we're not supporting the application build or any other flag added to the application. Future training and events, again, is the same. Uh, future events are also um, listed in this page. So we, 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 we're planning to run um, the Jasmine hands-on workshop this time uh, in, a, in the vir a virtual mode, uh, probably in November, but please watch this, this space on uh, future events. 
We're also thinking of running a webinar on the available Jasmine software stack as, as the software is a vital component of all the uh, analysis uh, platform and Lotus. And um, there will be probably another webinar on batch computing using Slurm. We did, we did have one that was more of a transition from the old Shadow LSF to Slurm, but this second one will be more on, of an advanced, intermediate advanced, which cover different features and different workaround for, for um, features that are not native to Slurm. And uh, finally, well, depending again on the COVID uh, situation, uh, we're planning to run the Jasmine 2020 um, uh, conference next year. And at the end, I encourage users, I uh, encourage you uh, who are using um, uh, um, extensively Jasmine to contribute and uh, share your expertise with us to help us deliver additional training and events for different specific applications, for example, R, CUDA, machine learning, singularity. Also, we, we really appreciate your help to improve any relevant documentation that we need to expose to users on this specific application. So please get in touch and contact us if you have any ideas to contribute to training. And uh, thank you for your attention. Fab. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, so I think actually now we've got a 10 minute break um, and then we are um, talking about the five common issues. So we will, yeah, we've actually got a 12 minute break because you finished early, well done. Um, so we will rejoin at 11.25 everyone. So go grab a coffee or whatever else you need or want. Cool. So <clears throat> we thought we would um, introduce a bit of a, a practical element to um, the user um, events this year. And so we've got a set of um, five common issues, um, probably slightly more than that in, in a few more details, um, which we, uh, a few of us are going to talk through. Um, and these are things that um, quite commonly come up as problems on the help desk. So it's kind of interesting to see the sorts of things that come up, but also hope to give people um, some practical solutions to some of those problems. So um, we're going to talk about uh, login problems, uh, some stuff about home directory and uh, how to um, restore from snapshot backups, a little bit about choosing the right storage, and then I'll hand over to Fatima to talk about uh, choosing the right compute for your workflow. And then uh, Ag's going to talk about um, how to build fault tolerance um, into your workflow. So um, in, under the banner of sort of login problems, I've got four um, issues here, which um, we, can, we can look at. Um, so we've got network related things. Um, sometimes there's a missing username, uh, which is an easy um, gotcha that catches a lot of people out. Um, there's the agent forwarding uh, at Old Chestnut. And um, actually less of a login problem, but more of a, a problem that can be solved by logging in a different way. Um, with our new um, graphical desktop service. So I'll just quickly um, show that. So uh, just in terms of a context diagram, obviously we're talking about um, the, the login nodes and you'll see we've got the, the yellow normal login, login nodes and next to that we've got the um, NX login nodes, which are the ones I'll mention for the fourth um, uh, sort of subtopic there. So that's where things fit in. So that's how you access most of the other resources within Jasmine. So it's quite important to be able to do these right. So the first um, one, we'll just talk about um, uh, network issues. Um, probably the symptom you'll see if you have this issue is uh, connection reset by peer or what some words to that effect. Essentially, um, the Jasmine has an allow list um, which uh, restricts access to Jasmine uh, from the entire internet down to um, institutions that we trust or networks that we trust and um, that have uh, contacted us to um, so that we're, we're sure that they're legitimate users of Jasmine rather than the bad guys. So um, if you like, when you um, connect from your um, university network, you will have an IP address and that should resolve to a host name like this one here, host 001myuniv.ac.uk. Um, and then that means that we can 
um, add to the allow list um, either individual university domains or in fact what we do is um, white, uh, sorry allow list we add to the allow list the whole of the star.ac.uk um, domain but for other non-university um, domains um, they need to be added uh, by um, um, asking the help desk. So um, uh, as I say normally you would connect from your institutional network that's that's what we would expect most users to do. Um, if you connect from your home broadband and I guess uh, this may be a, a more common issue at the moment um, first of all um, it's not going to be from a domain that we necessarily uh, trust or recognize um, also, um, it's not always the case that the IP address, the number bit, actually translates into a, um, a fully qualified host name. So that makes it more difficult for us to um, check it against the, um, the, the, the allow list. So we provide a handy tool um, at this URL here, um, which you can use to check, uh, you know, if you access that URL from the machine uh, that you're planning to contact Jasmine um, uh, from, that will um, tell you, A, does it resolve to your institutional, uh, does it resolve, first of all, um, to a host name, and does it resolve to your institutional domain? Because um, it's unlikely that it will be on the allow list uh, if it's not. And one thing you can do um, to try and mitigate that is that if, uh, you if your institution or your, your organisation provides a virtual private network, a VPN, um, you can connect via that, because that makes you, on your home broadband connection, um, uh, it assigns you an IP address belonging to that trusted network and in most cases that should also resolve to a, uh, to a host name which again then can be checked against the whitelist and off you go. Um, so that's a, a fallback solution for that and we would recommend that you try and contact, uh, connect from your uh, institutional network uh, wherever possible. Um, Recognising that that's not always possible however um, we do provide, um, instead of login uh, one, and I think there's some others, uh, there's login two.jasmine, and also with the graphical service, you'll see NX login two. Um, this has a slightly different set of rules to login one and four. And this means that you can connect um, from uh, your uh, home broadband connection if you need to. So the reverse DNS lookup rule is not applied. Um, there are some other rules that are applied. So you can connect, but you might be limited in what other services that you, you can access. For example, you can't get to the transfer uh, machines via, via that, um, where you can, you can log on to the transfer machines and pull data in um, uh, from within Jasmine, but you can't connect to those transfer machines directly from outside of Jasmine um, if you don't have this. There are some other data transfer services that you can use that are actually more efficient, um, and those are all documented in the help document. So, in, in theory, we should be able to cater for everybody. So another problem that um, sometimes catches people out is um, just forgetting to um, include the username in the SSH command. And usually the symptom for this would be um, permission denied. So uh, obviously on your local machine, your username um, might be different to your Jasmine username. So if you omit that username when you try to connect, um, either there's going to be no um, user by that name or it will try and if there is someone by that name already that isn't you it will try and connect uh, to someone else's account and either way that, that won't succeed uh, so uh, when you are connecting with the login machines uh, don't forget to use your your username it's quite a common problem and then another one is uh, making an onward connection um, so um, the primary um, sort of use case for this is obviously going through a login machine to one of the, the sign machines. So um, on your local machine, you should have your SSH uh, private key. Um, your private key stays on your machine and your public key is what's uploaded to the Jasmine accounts portal that goes into your user profile and it's shared with all the machines that you should have access to within Jasmine automatically. Um, if you uh, include the flag to enable agent forwarding, that ensures that once you've made this initial hop to the login machine, um, you can then make the extra hop to the uh, sign machine or wherever else you need to get to within Jasmine. And if you're using command line SSH, that's the minus A option. If you're using um, mob agent or within Mobrex term, or perhaps the, um, the NX uh, client, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, there's usually a tick box to enable agent forwarding. So that's important to remember. 
Um, just a few um, do's and don'ts about um, SSH keys as well. Obviously, um, your private key really can stay on your local machine. It shouldn't really need to go anywhere else. That's the best way to keep it secure. Um, you don't need to copy it to your Jasmine home directory. Um, you shouldn't need to because you can do this agent forwarding thing. So um, you should just keep it on your local machine um, in most cases. Um, do protect it uh, with a strong passphrase. Please do not use um, SSH keys that are unprotected. Um, that is against the rules. And also uh, don't edit your authorized keys file, which is in your SSH. Um, so this is the thing that um, we use to propagate your public key out to all the um, machines within Jasmine. If you do edit it, um, it will just get overwritten. So it's, um, it, please don't um, edit that. Um, and yeah, it is um, strictly one user, one key. So um, please don't share keys with colleagues um, or uh, other people. So um, in that way, we can help keep the system secure. Nice animation now I've got to use. Right, so onto the final section of login problems. So as I say, this wasn't so much a problem, it's more just um, uh, something that you can solve by logging in a different way. So um, Jasmine traditionally has been a, um, a command line, a terminal based um, a platform rather than a graphical uh, platform, but um, we have uh, been looking for a long time for a solution that allows us to give you better performance uh, with graphical applications. When you're using graphical applications, uh, they are they can be very slow. When you're sending back the graphics to your local machine over a, over a wide area network, a WAN. Um, so you'll have noticed the, the the yellow NX login nodes next to the login nodes on the um, sort of context diagram. So we're going to look at what 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 we're talking about there. So we now have a new service uh, using a, a software um, system called No Machine NX. And uh, we run a server on those NX login machines. And uh, to use it, you need to download a client, uh, the NX client, uh, which is available for Windows, Linux, or Mac. And you would use that to connect instead of uh, the terminal application. Um, so you, you fire up the client and you run it. So if you just kind of watch this little video here, um, the idea is we've got a connection profile, which we've already made, just pointing at one of those nodes. Um, I'm going to just use my SSH private key. So it's connecting over SSH in the same way as you would do normally. Pasting in my um, passphrase there. And then I can start a virtual desktop on the NX server. And because it's happening through the NX clients, these graphics are relayed back to my local machine really efficiently. And the performance difference is, is really quite um, um, marked. So it's well worth doing if you do use graphical applications. So now I'm using the agent forwarding, uh, the minus A option to connect to the, um, the, the SI4 uh, SI machine. And on that one, I'm just going to load up some little uh, graphical applications. So I'm doing module load contrib slash panoply. Panoply is a little um, viewer for HDF and NetCDF files. And I'm starting up this graphical application. Um, so as you can see, that's just started up. There'll be a little GUI. Um, and you can see I can use that GUI and it's pretty responsive. Um, once it's up and running, there's relatively little delay. And that's quite different to the experience that uh, you would get if you were using X11 um, graphics over a wide area network. So yeah, much better experience for graphics heavy applications. Um, and it is actually uh, the, the way you need to get to some uh, graphical tools that are available um, inside the fence, for example, the um, interface to the object storage um, is available uh, as a web-based tool but only inside uh, inside Jasmine itself. So for that purpose we actually provide the Firefox browser on the NX login machines themselves and um, so you don't even need to go to the, the sign machine and you can fire up the browser there and from there you can access those web-based tools that are only available inside the fence. Um, but it's often it's also useful for many more tools um, uh, that, that use graphics in a heavy way, like IDL, um, uh, plot outputs, that kind of thing. So if you want to find out more about that, look at uh, the help documents here and just search for NX. That's probably the easiest way to uh, locate those documents. So moving on then, I'll just grab a glass of water. Um, we'll look at um, your home directory and um, snapshot backups. So your home directory on Jasmine provides uh, 100 gigabytes of space. 
and that's on a uh, nice fast solid state disk storage uh, which is ideal as we've said here for um, files code python virtual environments and stuff but it is it's worth noting it's the only file system on jasmine which is backed up the only user file system that's backed up um, so regular and full incremental backups are done for you um, but uh, there's these all other type of backups called snapshot backups which are sort of a little known feature that um, you might find useful we'll have a look at those in just a second um, but if you want to find out, for example, how much space you're using to make sure you're within your 100 gigabyte quota, you can use the command PDU. So PDU is a special version of DU, um, which works particularly well with this type of storage. It works in parallel. And I've just applied two options there, the minus S for giving summary and uh, minus H for human readable, so in, in units that um, make sense. So I'm using 5.9 gigabytes out of my 100 gigabytes. So let's have a look now at um, how to restore from a snapshot. If, uh, and this, this is in the, uh, the help documents, by the way, so you can have a look at it there as well. If I go to um, uh, my home directory, um, which will be home users, my name, but I, I can uh, use this path here, home users dot snapshot slash um, uh, this path and uh, this environment variable here, which just means uh, my username. I can list all the snapshots that exist um, for me of my home directory and these will I think I actually truncated the list here there's a, there's a big list of these directories that will exist um, going back from yesterday the day before I think they're daily I'm not quite sure how regularly they're created but there should be one so this is ideal for those situations where you've just accidentally deleted a file and uh, it's a self-service way that you can restore um, files uh, to your home directory so if you just uh, perhaps choose the most recent one of these um, directories, you can find maybe this file here, 100m.dat, and it's as simple as just copying back from that uh, snapshot location to your own home directory to restore that file. So that's a really handy um, thing just to remember. So finally, uh, the last section of what I wanted to talk about was just about choosing the right storage. Um, we I showed on the, um, the context diagram previously, we've got um, a set of storage services. Um, so home directories, group workspaces, the transfer cache or XFC, Scratch, and there's also the Cedar archive. And then we've got this storage migration service, JDMA for moving data between those different types of media. Um, behind those services, we've got a range of uh, media types and uh, so the question is, you know, what would be the right uh, choice for your particular workflow? Um, so we not, can't necessarily ask, answer that question for every, every um, use case in this little talk, but what we can do is look at some of the properties of these different uh, types of storage and just um, and learn a bit about them. So um, just using those, those uh, types of storage here um, and, and the services that they kind of are used for, we can look at this kind of grid, which shows us some of the properties of um, these, these systems. So when we talk about disk storage on Jasmine, um, normally we mean uh, POSIX disk, because um, of course um, other types of um, storage like object store, they're also disk based, but we really mean uh, POSIX disk file systems. So we've got three main types of POSIX file system on Jasmine, uh, PFS, parallel file system, scale out file system or SOF, and then solid state disk or SSD. Now all of these do all of these can do uh, parallel read, um, but only the parallel file system can do parallel write. Now I say that, uh, what I actually mean is that in the way we have uh, this type of storage, the soft storage configured, um, we have it configured in a way that gives us the maximum capacity. Um, because all you data hungry users out there, um, you need that capacity to store your data, to be able to share it with each other. Um, there are ways that we can configure this storage um, to be to support parallel write, but it does um, consume a lot more storage. So the default um, configuration is that it um, is, is parallel read capable, but not parallel write. It's also worth noting that there's differences in um, the abilities of this uh, um, storage to, to deal in small files as well. So small files meaning um, sort of less than 64k, um, you know, little config files, Python environments, that kind of thing. Um, 
So parallel file system that we have does have a capability to deal with that. It's limited, so and that, that limit can be exceeded. Um, with the uh, soft storage, uh, the way we have it configured by default does not deal well with, with small files, uh, but we are in the process of adding um, a kind of mixed file layout capability that should um, enable better dealing with um, uh, small files in a way that's transparent to you, the user. But meanwhile, we have um, uh, the solids, we've employed the solid state disk storage um, as kind of add ons to a group workspace. So a group workspace could now consist of some soft storage, um, a small amount of solid state disk, uh, which we call the SNF or small files area, and potentially a tape quota as well. So your group workspace might actually consist of three different media types. So yeah, onto tape. So we have um, tape is used for um, both the, the backup for the Cedar archive. We mentioned that the Cedar archive is, is available um, throughout Jasmine read only. But the Cedar archive is hosted within Jasmine as a kind of special tenant, and it uses um, uh, tape as its primary backup for the archive. And there's also a staging system called the Nearline archive, which allows you to stage um, parts of data sets that otherwise wouldn't fit on disk um, for when they're needed. Also, we have a system called Elastic Tape, um, which you can use through this JDMA interface. And that is what allows you to move data that's in a group workspace between, oops, um, between uh, uh, disk and tape storage. So then we've got Object Store, which uh, we talked about a little bit already. And I think Neil's going to talk some more about um, later on in the uh, event. And then Block Storage, um, just to be aware of. Um, used for provisioning virtual machine disks and various sort of specialist um, storage for databases, that kind of thing. So these are the types of storage that we employ. Um, I'm running out of my time and I knew this would happen. So I think the best thing really is to acknowledge that there are lots of different types of storage available within Jasmine. It's worth learning about their properties and capabilities, their limitations, and how you can best apply those to your workflow. There is an exercise uh, within our Jasmine workshop training materials, which you can use to um, uh, kind of teach yourself about how to select the right storage for your workflow. Um, and hopefully that will mean that um, uh, you'll, you'll run into fewer problems and be able to complete your work more efficiently. So I think I'll stop there and hand over to Fatima. Thank you, Matt. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. I hope this is visible now. Yeah, you're fine, Fatima. Okay. Um, Thank you, Matt. I'll be talking about choosing the right compute services on Jasmine. What are they? Those services, they compromise the interactive uh, compute platform, which are the Synode and Notebook, but I won't be covering Notebook. Uh, my colleague, I will cover the Notebook later on. And I'll talk about choosing the batch compute, which is our uh, cluster Lotus, uh, on which compromise um, compute node, CPU, uh, CPU format and GPU notes. So let's start with the interactive compute. So the interactive compute composed of sign notes. Um, we provide seven uh, different um, scientific analysis platform here, which are listed here um, from Sci one to Sci six and then Sci eight. Uh, they have, they, there's two group of uh, um, um, category of this size. There's the low spec uh, machine which are um, which has which have eight CPUs and 32 gigabytes of memory and is the high memory scientific analysis servers which is SI3, SI6 and SI8. Uh, two of the of these two two of them have one uh, terabyte each and 48 CPU cores. Access to this machine is open to all users the, through an SSH from the login node. There is no control of resource users um, um, on this uh, platform. 
the software stack is available is the same on this site as it is on Lotus and across other servers. Um, in terms of storage, uh, the, the, all the volumes like group, uh, group workspaces, home directory, access to the archive for, read, uh, for reading data is um, available. And it's in uh, X11, which is uh, graphic forwarding, is enabled on those machines. So as I said, there's no control. So we really want users to be aware of uh, the resources they use there and to be aware of that they are sharing that, that resource with other users. So there has been so many, many issues that I'm gonna cover here today, starting with multiple applications. Usually you, uh, people uh, use run applications, they sit in the background, they're in sleep mode, but they are still using the resources, mainly the memories. So it's always good practice before launching another application, check what is running on the system and reduce the number of processes. And there are some utilities uh, command here like PS or top command, which is quite useful to show, show what is running uh, owned by the user and use the command kill followed with the process ID to reduce the number. An example of which we have in the past um, several IPython uh, instances or Emac instances running on the same machine can really affect the performance because we really use more resources. And the second, um, second issue is running graphics application. Um, it can be very frustrating if the machine is overloaded, the graphics gets flaky and jittering. So the solution for this is to consider using the no machine that my colleague Matt uh, uh, presented earlier after installing the NX client. So this is kind of a way around to improve the graphics sent uh, to your local machine by using this uh, no machine service. It's a new service and there's plenty of uh, uh, documentation on the Jasmine uh, uh, website as well as some video tutorials. Now, high memory, CPU intensive and long time processes. Why does it matter? Of course it does, it does matter because these machines are not, they're not purpose for high intensive processing of this sort. And they will degrade the performance for other users because we, we, there's no control of the resources used and the access is open for everyone unless uh, the user check the load and they decide to go to other machines. So we, it, is, it, is the, it is better to consider moving all this processing of this kind of resource requirement to the batch compute. So for more, more issues is to do with not knowing much about what the code is doing. And sometimes some application can start simple and easy, not consuming that much resources, but then burst into using heavy resources. And the example of which is if you have a, um, a multi-threaded um, uh, Python or um, calling a function that is uh, spawning thread at runtime, it's not easy to know at first glance from the code that the code is multi-threaded. So I encourage monitoring here. And if, if the usage is over 90% or over 100, sometimes uh, 600 uh, percent, that is indicative is the code is re really heavy, heavy CPU and it will, or will uh, impair other users on the same machine. So in this case, it's better to move this uh, processing to Lotus, or at least if you're not unsure, use the high memory side because it has, it has more cores than the, the low spec side machine, side one, side one and two. And another utility is just to find out um, using one of this uh, uh, PS command with optimized T that will list the threads uh, just to kind of give you assurance that actually this is a multi-threaded and it is better to move it to Lotus. Another issue that has been reported is ideal development license licenses on the side machine are limited. And um, the, the, the reason being is the side machine are not for production run. So any code development or testing should be short and shouldn't be using the license for running hours or days on the side machine. So for this, consider using the Lotus 
because they are, the runtime license pool is uh, quite large and you can run as many jobs as, as you want on, uh, on the Lotus. Another issue to cover is um, the local TAM get filled up on the side machine. We, and the documentation explicitly said not, not to use the TAM on the, on the side machine, but there has been instances where, for example, put the user installing some R packages. So R by default will write, fill up the TAM for those intermediate or auxiliary files and the user is unaware that the TAM get fills and that will affect uh, affect significantly uh, the, the performance on the site and also uh, the access logging into the site will be affected because the SSH keys get stored um, on the TAMP. So for a resolution around this is to, to consider um, directory within the group workspace as your as a temporary directory by uh, configuring the TAMP uh, environment variable for this. And this is also illustrated in the documentation. And the last uh, um, issue that we've uh, noticed uh, quite often, you find people using the site for transferring data. And we know there is a site, there is a, site, a data transfer server which are being optimized for this purpose. But there has been instances for people using it for um, moving data from the work scratch especially those who are doing parallel write, they need to write to the uh, uh, parallel file system PFS. So for, for this, we really um, encourage users to use the B copy service. It's an efficient way of doing parallel, uh, of doing parallel transfer and it uses Lotus nodes. So moving now to the second type of uh, compute services available, which is the batch cluster. So the batch, the cluster is, is, is uh, um, composed of many hosts of different specs and of different uh, number of cores and uh, CPU models. And because this resource is uh, quite big, so it needs a, a manage a system, so which is a piece of software, an intelligent piece of software to manage the usage and access to the, to the cluster. So what are the differences between interactive compute and the batch compute? The first difference is there's no direct access to the compute node. Access to the compute is always via the, the batch scheduler system, which is now slow. Um, there's no GUI um, environments uh, um, enabled on those uh, on the on the Lotus, and the resources are controlled here compared to the Synode uh, and um, Slurm does the control and uh, uh, allocate the resources uh, on a fair share uh, uh, by fair share and also by priority. And it, it has a greater computing power comparing. Com compared to the side, there are, machine, there are many machines with different core, different number of processors with different uh, memory size. So it, it is the right place for large processing or production run in general. So how the, how the resources are classified here is, is through some queuing system mechanism. And I've just put here, uh, highlighted the uh, provision of a test queue which is good for um, uh, testing your code and checking what the, uh, checking and estimating the resources required, and then deciding which which uh, scheduling queue to use. And by default, the short serial queue, um, uh, even if it's not specified, uh, job submitted to Lotus will will be allocated to this queue. I mean, the queues they have different policy, they have different limitation, and an example of which gives you here the time limit, which is in number of days. Um, for the short serial test is, is kept very short because it's a test four hours and it's it can uh, accept any 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 type of workflow what is multi threaded open MP, MPI so it's very it, it is a testing um, uh, uh, place for um, code that is not very, that you're not familiar or code that has been passed on to you and you did a bit of development on it. So what are the key issues for Lotus users? One of the key issue is the specification of the resources. Most of the time, the resources specified in the job script is not matching the queue that was selected. Um, an example of which not being able to know 
what's what's the code is is it a serial is it a mixed hybrid does it launch does it spawn threads at runtime so not knowing the cpu core how much memory uh, it uses at runtime does it burst uh, because some some code they might change the how they, they, uh, they use memory doing some uh, um, uh, random calculation or Monte Carlo calculation where the size of the array can change dramatically um, uh, during the runtime and also whether it's um, it's, it's a shared um, shared or distributed uh, memory uh, uh, type of par parallelism so where you have different process or task accessing the same memory on the node or accessing uh, um, memory uh, distributed across multiple nodes uh, also not being able to know how long would it take for the job to complete so jobs will time out in this case because it's not been estimated uh, correctly another issue related is the cpu processor model the reason i mentioned here because jasmine is a heterogeneous infrastructure we have different um, uh, compute of different model the majority are intel but we have now um, uh, amd hosts so um, compiling on any detail and running on IMD can, can, can trigger issues um, and incompatibility, especially for um, um, vectorization code has been optimized to use vector units. So that can, that can, that can impact the, uh, the performance and also job, job just might fail running on IMD. Um, uh, next is, which queue? So as I said, the queues here, this is just sum, to summarize, SIG, um, it, it is essential to know whether the code is sequential or parallel. What I mean by sequential, so it's it just one process. Um, parallel can be uh, multiple processes through some NPR tasks, which are uh, access memories um, in, a, in a distributed uh, manner or, or um, um, multi-threaded, which are accessed in the memory on the node. So for sequential op codes, we have two types of serial, code, serial queues, one with a maximum time of 24 hours and another one with a long time of seven hours. If the code is serial but uses high memory, then uh, there's a high memory queue uh, for, for this. Multi-threaded application type um, OpenMP and so on, um, you can use the parse single key for this. And any distributed memory parallelism, like MPI um, um, codes, the par par multi is, 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 is used. You can, is this, we can use the parse single as well, but it depends how, how the number, if the number of core account is high, so the par multi would, would, be, would be better to use. Then if, if not sure about the resources required, so here it is essential to do a test. And for this, um, the test queue is provided. Another key issue is why a job failed. There are many reasons for a job to, to fail. So this is kind of uh, what, what I think are commonly encountered by users is Sometimes the application executable is not found, maybe in the job script points to a, in, uh, to a location that is not accessible or the file is not there either. Um, sometimes the environment variable are not passed to the execution host. So we encourage that every environment variable should, should, should be explicitly added into the job script file. Um, this doesn't mean that if you don't add, add if, if it's not being added and you, and the user is on the shell where they are doing their development and running the code because the environment get inherited. But we're not sure if you move to another shell, it's no guarantee that the, the module are coded in place. This is the same environment. So for productivity and efficiency, it's better to keep all the environment in the job script file. Um, another issue is job overrunning uh, because of um, are you so waiting to access uh, um, a group workspace or access the file? And sometimes these are you wait can be a symptom of file being deleted or, or file being um, um, having being locked because there's another process writing to that same file. So uh, this is one of the symptoms. So make sure that it's um, you're writing in the appropriate uh, storage for this and. Uh, 
the file exists and you don't have concurrent jobs, that one is creating a file, the other one is deleting it, and another process writing, trying to read that file that is not existing anymore. Um, another issue is some jobs um, trying to do compilation, um, the, so several jobs doing compilation at the concurrently. So some of them might run, some of them might, might uh, fail because the, the limitation on, on, the on the compiler license, for example, for Intel. So for this case, it's better to have, if it's the same uh, model or processing, it's better to have it compile it once in single job, and then the rest of the job just use the binary of the executable. Now, the other two issues more related to the, to the storage on to, for which your job is either writing or mainly the writing, because if the group workspace, for example, get filled up, then the job will try to write is filled up. There will be waiting time when the increase, and of course the job will, will just time out. And um, job also fail if they are writing to the work scratch um, and uh, the local temp on the, on the host. Even we have now um, uh, an automatic uh, clear out uh, uh, to process running um, regularly or weekly to clear file that are uh, older than 28 days per time access. It, it's, it, it, it won't prevent sometimes if there's a burst of file that has been written by user that can fill up the, the work scratch. So this is for one of the reason uh, that you can to look out when to try to find out why the job uh, failed. So we've got about two minutes, all right. Another issue is why job is pending um, during high load periods. Of course, job uh, there's many jobs and the uh, demand is high and resources are not available. So job job will, will, be, will continue to pend. Uh, than the usual normal uh, like few hours or so. Um, jobs that are, require excessive resources that are not uh, easily uh, available, like a job submitted requiring 64 calls on one node. We don't have a node with this, uh, since, uh, with this uh, uh, spec. Uh, job dependency condition cannot be met, so the job will continue to depend indefinitely. And also the queuing, the priority, which is, the, which is a factor that is calculated by Shadow based on the age of the job, so the queuing time and the fair share. And sometimes, well, if small jobs, you submit million of jobs at one time, that can also cause an overhead in the, sh in the shadow road to manage them together and allocate resources. So this is an example scenario of Lotus use. So I'm just gonna go quickly and this so scenario for one, for example, you have a job running that are writing small file to the group workspace um, based on the software as my colleague has uh, uh, presented earlier. Job is running very slow, um, and then the job screen has been adapted to instead of using the, this group of the this storage system, so is using the SSD, which is optimized for small uh, small file that has improved the running time from two days to a couple of hours, um, and then because we're using a scratch, so a job another job to do the cleaning uh, cleaning afterward is based on dependency, and the job using the blue copy service to move the data around. So this is kind of a, sim a, a typical workflow that we expect users to follow when they are using the work scrap and also the choice of the work of the stories for a typical, um, for example, here writing small files. Another scenario is a job running on the short serial queue, or, but this job was trying to use more than one, one CPU. The job will appear running slowly, and this is quite a symptom of typical a uh, job that is uh, trying to spawn threats. So we're trying to go beyond the capacity of one CPU. So in this case, job should be killed and should be submitted to the bar single with a specification of the number of the calls required. So summary, um, covering the two, the two services, which is the scientific analysis platform. We, it's all about being sensible in the uh, of resources usage because we don't control the, the, uh, the resources. Um, and being aware of sharing because the other users are, 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 are on the same machine as you, doing uh, other processing as you. And also a, a little knowledge of the application of the code, especially the minimum of whether it's sequential or parallel. So you can, can use which side machine, maybe use the high memory for if, if you think that the code is more threaded uh, for, for testing, of course. And always think of the side machine as a platform for development, testing, and light interactive use, rather than for productions. 
for the batch computes, always, of course, it's, it's a controlled resource. But again, for, for, for efficient use, it's always good to estimate the resources. So you estimate the resources required and you allocate the, the uh, appropriate queue for this. Um, whether I'm sure that the task is very short and you have 100,000 million of small tasks, maybe consider grouping some small tasks into a single job for efficiency as well, or using other features of the, uh, the batch system like job array or multi-stepping. And um, finally, use job dependency to build the workflow as it's, uh, shown in scenario one. If you're using the scratch, it would be very useful to do to clear the, uh, the usage of that scratch area. And uh, I will pass on now uh, to my colleague, Ag, and thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. So I'm just going to stop uh, sharing. Hi everyone. So um, for those of you that, that didn't see the introduction, uh, my name is Ag Stevens and I'm the head of partnerships at CEDA and following on nicely really from the stuff that Fatima has been talking about, um, this particular issue is about building a fault tolerant workflow on Jasmine. Um, so I mentioned workflows earlier on and um, we've done some work on this in the last um, year and a half trying to meet the needs of a number of users that were coming to us and, and talking about you know, how you go about building a, a robust, um, reliable workflow. So first of all, let's just think, what do we mean by a workflow? Um, I'm interpreting it as a set of tasks that need to be processed in order to complete an overall goal. Now, typically many of these tasks can be run in parallel and in some cases, there are tasks that will be dependent on the completion of others. So when we're trying to define an efficient workflow, um, there are some things that we should bear in mind. So every single task, we should be able to monitor the status of it, um, and we should be able to record the status of it once it has completed or failed. Um, and, and one of the key targets with this is that we want to have we want to be able to create a safe rerun of either a part a part of the workflow or even the entire workflow itself. So why does it need to be fault tolerant? Unfortunately, building big workflows and running them on big batch compute compute platforms um, inevitably mean that it's very unlikely that all of your tasks will run the first time that you try and run them. Let's say you've got a workflow made of made up of 500,000 tasks. There are lots of things that might prevent that from just running in a single go. For example, unforeseen error conditions that you just hadn't considered. Um, typically on somewhere like Jasmine, you are processing data. So there might be problems with some of the input files that cause your code to fail in some ways. And of course, there might also be system problems. So there might be issues with communications between nodes. Um, the, as um, Fatima was talking about, you know, all, all these resources are shared resources and sometimes the activity of another user may cause problems for your processes. So the key thing is that you want to build it so that you can rerun your workflow until it has run to completion. And the key thing there is that we're not rerunning the whole thing anytime. We're only rerunning the bits that didn't run before. It's maybe worth reflecting for a moment on um, the idea of an embarrassingly parallel workflow. So these are workflows where you can literally break up your task. So you've got a giant task, say it's, I want to process 10,000 input files, but every single um, task within that overall workflow is completely independent of the others. And this kind of thing is absolutely perfect for a batch processing system like Lotus, because all you have to do is instead of looping through processes that you would run sequentially, you just farm them all out to our batch processing service and, and the jobs will all run in parallel for you. They may take a while, depending on how busy the queues are and how busy the cluster is, but you can just push all the work out and it will run on parallel. And you don't care which node it's running on because you know all the same software is available on those nodes 
um, and you'll have tested it. And an important thing to know if you've not done any batch processing before is that batch compute is not interactive. And the first lesson of that is that you cannot see it. So most of us in the olden days, we're used to the idea that you start running something and you watch your terminal and you can scroll back up in your terminal to see what happened. And you'll either have it just um, information reporting to the terminal or you might have errors that appear there. So you can you can see what's happening with batch compute. It requires a different approach. So you need to log things. You need to know where your logs are going. You need to check the status of your processes. So you need to check when the things failed or succeeded. And then really importantly, you need to record those successes and failures in a traceable way. And the key thing here is, is that you want to be able to easily assess how much of your overall workflow has run. And so there are various ways you can do this. So um, an example that, that we've thought about is the idea that you start with a processing unit. OK, so here on the right, you have your unit. And this can be typically a small script or function that carries out an operation. Um, it's entirely predictable in that you can measure it. Um, this enables you to, to test and debug the sort of foundation or the core of your workflow. And it acts as the basic building block. So your unit must take an input or a set of inputs and it needs to generate some kind of output. Now, typically on Jasmine, the, the inputs are likely to be data files. The outputs are likely to be data files. But if you define a unit and you know exactly what it does, what its inputs are, what its outputs are, then it's something that you can really easily manage. So you can execute your unit in a piece of Python code or a command line script, any kind of executable thing um, that you can measure. And when you're building a workflow and you've got these units, units, it's really quite useful if you can run a single unit relatively quickly, because then as you're testing and prototyping, building up from that unit, you can do lots of iterations, you can fix things and build it from there. It's really, really important that you're able to define and record your successes and failures. And you do this at the level of the unit. So inside each unit, you might define a set of errors that you know might happen. So you, can, you might have a bad data error where you, you couldn't read the input file. You might have a processing error when there were, for some reason, whilst it was processing, um, an error was raised by your code. And then if you've done, if you've, if you've taken the time to do this and you understand your unit and your code well enough, then before running each unit, your code can check if success was previously recorded. If it, if it hasn't previously run and been successful, then you run the unit, you catch any errors and you record either the error or the success. And there are lots of different ways you can do this. Um, you could put this information in log files, you could put it in a database, um, there's many different approaches. So one of the things that we've come up with as a way to try and help people who are moving old sequential and interactive workflows into a, a kind of batch approach is we've come up with this thing called ABC unit, okay? And this is just a, an example framework that's in a GitHub repository that you can take a look at and hopefully learn from or adapt if you want to build something like this. So we're imagining we, we have a great big workflow. It's doing lots of things, but, but we, we can define a single unit that we understand the inputs to and the outputs. So we take that individual unit and then we build a thing called a chunk. So this is the C in the name, and a chunk is made up of running a series of units. The chunk itself is then a component of a batch. So the B is the batch. And I think you get the idea now. We now have all. So the A is for all. So the idea behind creating a structure like this is that as, as the, uh, the controller of the workflow, 
you can start by working at the unit level. You can make sure your unit is predictable and makes sense. You can then um, build a chunk around it and say, well, I want to run all these things together. And you can build up from there until eventually you can potentially just have a single script that will run your whole workflow in a single go. So it's important, really important that you test at each level when building the workflow. So once you've written the unit, test it interactively on the SI servers. Does it catch the errors properly? Does it avoid rerunning after success? So what you really want to do is you, you run it once on a unit. If it works, you run it again and it just logs. I don't need to run again because I've done this before. So then we can build up to the chunk. And again, the chunk is still relatively small. So we can define a limited number of units that we're going to run on within a chunk and run that interactively on the SI servers again, test that it works properly, test the results are predictable, test it's logging correctly. And then again, take it up to the next level. So we build the batch and we can run that interactively on a limited number of chunks. Now, by the time you're running the batch, you may well be running these things on Lotus. But the key thing here again, is that you're not running the whole thing and just hoping that it works. You're building up in stages, building your confidence that your workflow is, is robust and, and is fault tolerant and managing its outputs properly. And finally, when you've done all these things, you should be safe to run the whole thing. So I'm not gonna have time to talk in detail about our example, but um, here's a link to it on GitHub. So it's called ABC unit CMIP5 stats. And the way it works is it, um, the, the particular example we chose was we took the, the fifth coupled model into comparison project or CMIP5, which is a very large um, collection of climate simulations. And these are run for many models, many experiments, um, and for a, a whole load of other variables within, within a very sort of um, multi-dimensional um, array of possible inputs. So in this example, we're saying we care about the types of stats that you might calculate. So we're cal calculating temporal statistics. So you can get the mean, the max and the min. We are interested in the models. We are interested in um, a particular experiment in this case. So we've picked an experiment. Um, and we're interested in the ensemble members that are running and the variables or variable IDs that are running. So if we start at the top here, we have a simple run all script. So this is the thing that you can run and it will run the whole of your ABC unit. Um, in this case, we're just selecting a single statistic. So we want the mean, but we want the mean for all models, all ensembles, all variables. You can also run at the command line, run batch, and that, that gives you the option of specifying the model and the statistic. At the chunk level, we are saying you can also add the ensemble member. And then within runchunk.py, we have a function called run unit. And you give that the statistic, the model, the ensemble, and the variable ID. So we've broken up this large piece of processing into various components that get smaller and smaller and more specific and are all measurable. In terms of how this actually works on Jasmine, um, I, I believe that inside Run Batch, we actually submit all the jobs to um, Lotus that then call Run Chunk on Lotus. So as I say, we've tested Run Unit and we've tested Run Chunk interactively, but when we run the whole thing, Run All just kicks off a load of Run Batch scripts, and those Run Batch scripts then submit as many run chunk scripts as, as necessary onto Lotus. And this might be days and days of processing that needs to be done. It will all be queued on Lotus. And when there's enough free space, it will all run as it needs to run. So we have an animation of, of um, seeing this in action. Again, I'm not going to show this now, but the, the links here, if you'd like to go away and have a look, and you can just see how we run different parts of it. So just before I finish, a few things to consider about building these kind of workflows. So on Lotus, um, we have a test queue. Um, and the test queue is just about running test jobs. So start with the test queue um, when you're running your early jobs. And then you can migrate to using other queues, um, depending on the, your, your 
um, CPU requirements, your memory requirements, um, and, and the duration of the jobs, you might choose different queues. Getting the job size right is really important. You want to avoid too many Lotus jobs, and you also want to avoid jobs that complete very quickly. So there isn't an exact number, um, but if it looks like you're going to be running millions of jobs, that's likely to be too many. And equally, if it looks like a single job is going to run in you know, less, than, less than 30 seconds or something like that, um, that also looks like it's too many. So you're kind of looking for a sweet spot to break up your processing into a sensible number of batches, chunks and units so that you're using the system as efficiently as you can. Um, you should think about using scratch disk, um, which may be faster than using um, your group workspace in some cases, and you might want to put temporary data on there. And, and as we say and have said many times, make sure you're clearing up your directories and outputs when you finish. So thank you very much. Um, that's all from this section. Um, please follow all those links um, if you want to find out more or, or get in touch and ask us questions. Um, and as ever, you can contact us in many ways as shown here. Right, thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. There's just a couple more slides I think I forgot to tell you about. Do you want me to share it instead? Um, sorry, I think you told me about it yesterday, but yes, please do. <laughs> That's OK. Uh, I think it was that. Let me sort my screens out. Can you see that okay? Yes. Fab. Do you want to go through it or do you want me to go through it as I've got the clicker? You you go ahead. All right. I've talked too much. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, this is just the things that we've covered today as a quick reminder, everyone. Um, and another reminder that we've recorded all of this, so you'll be able to watch back if you missed anything or you had to nip out or anything. Um, so that's day one covered. And then I guess probably what you want to know is the timings for tomorrow. Um, so this is our rough aim of tomorrow's times. Uh, if there's a particular talk that you want to join, please make sure you join a bit early just in case for some reason we're um, running early. Then yeah, I don't want you to miss out. So that's the timetable for tomorrow. Very busy day. And then um, oh, one thing to point out is the Q&A panel session at the end of the day, lots of you have submitted questions today. Um, so those will hopefully be answered tomorrow at 11.30. If we don't get a chance to cover them, then that may be because they're a little bit too technical or we, we need to come back to you for more details. So if that's the case, then we'll email you. But most of them, I think, should be covered in that panel session tomorrow. And then that's it. So we shall see you tomorrow at 10am. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a good day.